So, uh, okay. Um, kia ora. Uh, my name is Laurel L. Barr, um, and I um, am coming to you from the, the frame of reference of art and art education um, with those skills in my kete and in my focus as an artist, I've been looking at the meshing of the intricacies of health, art, and psychology and society in various forms for approximately 10 years. Um, I was trained as a painter um, and did extensive uh, detailed anatomical studies um, in the morgues of New York City, um, but moved quickly on to working with kind of uh, more non-traditional materials conceptual art, installation, um, and actual materiality, and looking at the narrative qualities different materials can bring. Um, through my Renaissance studies when I lived in Italy, um, reminded me that there was once a time when artists and scientists were seen in the same category um, and considered in the same field of discovery and creativity um, discipline and, and philosophy. Um, around this time, um, I also came across a poet who I was amazed by called William Carlos Williams, um, who was an American physician. Um, he uh, was born in 1883, um, and he was also an amazing artist and art critic, um, as well at, as being a doctor. Um, and by learning from his writings and his passions, I, I saw how much he was able to uh, integrate arts into his practice and how his practice informed his arts. Um, and I started to think about the psychological nature of the practice of medicine and how experiences could inform a, a practitioner. Um, Recently, um, I came across a study from the General uh, Journal of General Internal Medicine where medical students were assessed by their exposure to the humanities and how that affected the traits that are desirable for mm -hmm. medical practitioners. And uh, guess what? The more arts that were included in their, um, in their practice, um, the more improved results they had. Um, so recently I exhibited a body of work called the Panacea Placebo Project um, at PlayStation Gallery here uh, in Wellington. And then um, also the University of Otago Medical School invited me to come and, um, and do some work there, an exhibition there. Um, so the Panacea Placebo Project started 10 years ago um, after I had a surgery and I realized that everyone wanted to tell me about a particularly bad or good health experience that they had and how significant it was to their lives um, and to their further relationship with healthcare. And I started to become really curious and fascinated with the concepts of health communication and how that affected the outcomes um, and the psychological nature of medical interactions. Um, so I started to do some conversations and do some research studies about health relationships and experiences. Um, and the discussions and narratives brought um, descriptions of being a patient and the doctor-patient relationship um, and the communication factors and, and above all the sense of ownership of, of one's body. And I realized that almost everyone had a story to tell about their health or their care or their interaction with the health field um, that had become part of themselves and how they reacted to interactions in further health care. Um, I started off with a online qualitative survey and asked some basic questions about people's experiences and what they wanted to say. And this led to 53 people replying 
to my um, survey from which I extracted data and 12 were interviewed further for more detailed stories and investigations on how the um, experiences had affected their health results and outcomes. Um, and it became quite clear that the, from the research that more investigation into how we might change the dynamics of power and self-empowerment and reverse how health is sometimes perceived as um, it is needed. So in collating um, my research um, and what I started to call the narratives of health drama and trauma, um, I felt the need to remedy their experiences. And I, I wished that I could create a cure-all panacea to help people progress um, and process their sometimes stressful interactions with healthcare providers. Um, but all I could really offer them was reassuring placebos, and that's where the name Panacea Placebo Project came from. Um, I discovered that relationships in, in health, particularly between doctor and patient, and the perceptions that fall into place on both those parts was often the crux of, of the problem there. Um, and it seemed that a lot of people had lost trust in their own instincts and their own bodies. And medicine in general has gone heavily into science of drug research and technology. Um, and it seems that they've left uh, a large percentage of humanity and, and truly listening to ailments behind. And, and looking further, um, I took to speaking to doctors and those in the medical community about what's working and what isn't in medical training and actual practice and what people could do to feel empowered by their health relationships and communications. Um, so I'm gonna show you some of the artworks um, that I've been working on um, that have been, some have been exhibited, some are still, um, still to be seen um, in the public forum. Um, this one is called Do No Harm and it is a, was a regularly used stethoscope, which was gifted to me from my mother, who's a retired nurse. Um, it had been used on many patients over the years and was her trusty little tool. Um, the phrase, can you hear me, is etched into it now, and it reminds us that listening is important for both the patient and the healthcare provider. Um, my survey and research into those patient dynamics that led me to believe that this is one of the most important phrases for the patient and the healthcare provider to be aware of. Uh, both need to listen and feel heard in communication for the best results and satisf satisfaction and care. Uh, a lot of respondents cited the ability to listen and allowing the patient to feel heard in a, a non-judgmental way was often the key to earning their respect and um, the subsequent medical compliance and listening to what the doctor did have to say. Um, but generally people wanted to feel that they were participants in their own care and their own conversations with doctors. And um, this piece is called Sticks and Stones and it's a uh, anatomical, um, medical anatomical leg. Um, and this is a reflection from the old childhood rhyme, sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. Um, many people who were interviewed stated that the clinicians, the wording or the, the choices of uh, words or lack thereof was a big factor in how the patient felt about the interaction. Um, that intonation of voice, badly selected phrasing, subtle factors like <laughs> eye contact and personal space between the doctor and clinician were all um, small little nuances that made very big influences to those with uh, stories to tell. Um, this is a piece called Haere e Fai Te Waiwai o Unuku Ki Ora Ai Te Tangata. Um, and it's made of surgeon's masks, various bandages, 
medical cotton and sutures, pill capsules, microscope slides, hospital blankets, um, and the uh, plants, manuka, kawakawa, kohai, uh, nikau, toy toy, harakiki, and pohutakawa. Um, and this piece was a direct result from my attending a uh, parts of uh, a PRIDOC conference, which is the Pacific Region Indigenous Doctors Congress. Um, I attended um, a few of their conferences as an observer and, uh, and I listened to the camaraderie between the Indigenous doctors um, and many of whom didn't even speak the same language, but the same issues were coming up in their training and their professional lives. And things like how the boundaries between colonized medicine and traditional medicines are now becoming a little bit blurry with each kind of taking from one another. Um, the work was created to give thanks and appreciation to the hardships that indigenous, specifically Maori doctors have had to endure historically and contemporarily um, and the interactions that can affect the dynamics of understanding between clinicians from both Western and Indigenous healthcare providers, between healthcare providers and patients. And the title um, translates um, from the Maori as search for the footprints of Uenuku so that humans will find their health. And Uenuku uh, was uh, a, a, a Māori Atua god um, said to have been a very wise woman who held many secrets behind um, health and welfare. Um, it's a faux kākahu, or kākahu is a, a, a cloak, a type of cloak, um, and it's not meant to be an appropriation, and it's, this one is not meant to be worn, but rather an object of contemplation, reflection, and a tribute to the Māori doctors and the mana that, who have come from one world of Māori being and in, into another world choosing Western medicine as a focus. Um, it's also hand sewn using traditional raranga weaving techniques and medical stitching suturing techniques. Um, and it incorporates traditional Māori Rongoa medicines um, together with modern medical materials. Um, it's intended to bring awareness of the journey of the modern Māori doctor, um, but also acknowledgement of how cultures need to bridge various worlds to communicate with each other and bring each brings their to the relationship their own history and experience into um, all the various medical interactions. Um, then I uh, also looked into the work of Dr. Masuru, Masaru Emoto uh, while I was doing research and discovered that um, he, uh, his research discovered that uh, when water was exposed to various words or sounds or thoughts, it affected what type, um, what type of crystal they produced. Um, and he premised that water could hold thoughts such as positive words and that water could be used to affect the body then. And the properties such as water being affected by various energies such as magnetic fields, so why not electrical pulses from words or thoughts? And I got to thinking about how we might not just have a, a psychological response to the words that are chosen, but also the care and concern that is put into a treatment um, and the belief that an efficacy on the behalf of the doctor and the patients. Um, and this brought me to um, a, a series called An Ounce of Prevention is Worth a Pound of Cure and is comprised of pharmaceutical supplies, gold, silver, lapis lazuli, pigments, string, infused water, tinctures, um, soaps, glitters, bandages, um, earth and aqueous creams and matches and 
um, the viewers uh, in this little pharmacy, the viewers are invited to help themselves to a selection to take home um, a variety of quote unquote treatments um, that require attention in their lives, such as grounding or peacefulness or brightness or tethering. Um, in this little pharmacy that I made, um, I was trying to get viewers to consider how simple treatments can have similar outcomes when they trust themselves as they might trust those in a traditional medical setting. Um, various studies have shown that tangible objects can be in inflected and imbued with spiritual elements that give them power and affect the ability to transfer thoughts, feelings, and it can empower one to feel better uh, satisfaction in care. So some of these seemingly placebo treatments can have real positive results depending on the belief and understanding of the people who use them. So here's um, some close-ups of the labels. Um, this one, uh, comprised of a, a pocket flashlight um, and was to be used for moments of intense anxiety and focus. Um, here's another one that was a water tincture imbued with positive sentiments a la Dr. Emoto. Um, and it gives you a, a recommended usage as well. Um, this installation I did was called the Office of Dr. Mara Devereaux, um, and it's comprised of medical antiques and ephemera, uh, medical texts, an examination table, various medications, a stethoscope, and a doctor's lab coat. Um, Dr. Mara Devereaux is a fictional character that I created that evolved in my imagination over the time that I interviewed patients and doctors for their experiences. I kind of see her as a kind older woman who has seen many things in her life and in her practice and her demeanor is kind and gentle, compassionate and someone who listens with a ready ear. Um, and her office is interesting and non-threatening and has a kind of timeless quality. Um, so when asked what makes a good medical professional's traits and bedside manners, um, what, what should they entail? I was inundated with the concepts that they should be, that should be evident in all doctors that <laughs> by those who I interviewed. Um, I discovered that things like integrity, honesty, dependability, compassion, were all, almost often more important than even the doctor's technical skills and competence. Um, reassurance and personal qualities of the doctor kind of topped, often topped knowledge and skill depending on the situation. Um, so this is uh, Dr. Mara's lab coat. Um, the next uh, pieces I, I was working on um, is a series called On the Mend. Um, and this is a group of works that were initially exhibited in Wellington um, with the Panacea Placebo Project. And I was using my own experience as an example of reflection between my own healthcare providers and myself. Uh, the series was made um, in response to the research findings that the feelings of ownership and of bodies and various body parts um, and to be an equal part of the decision making about what happens when it's often neglected. Um, what was often seen by doctors to be non-compliance is often patients using their own feelings and experience and understanding of their own bodies. For example, when uh, someone feels pain and they're not adequately addressed by a doctor or when um, they'd been misdiagnosed um, and continued to seek out answers. Um, and the series used various body parts and tissues to literally spell out words that described the interaction between myself and the clinicians. Um, 
but also the roles that the doctor kind of played in the interactions. For example, in one of my ankle reconstruction surgeries, a graft was taken from my semitendinosus tendon, which is a, a hamstring, uh, a, more or less a hamstring muscle or tendon. Um, and I, I had the leftover tissue and I used that to spell out the word power which is um, alluding to the physical power that the tendon actually holds um, and the power of the surgeon to fix the ankle and the dynamics of power in the situation between um, doctor and patient. Um, this one is called open. It's a surgical blade that was used to remove a tumor um, on my finger. Um, this is a uh, call, it's called Deliver, and it is my son to pull up to the William Creed Cor Bar Cormax uh, placenta, which was delivered on May 31st, 2009. Um, this is the power. This is a semitendinosus tendon uh, removed by Gareth Coulter to uh, recreate an ankle, um, and this was the leftover tissue. Um, the next series uh, is called Bill of Health, and it is black resin coated metal, um, gauze, medical gauze, and uh, paper that is marbled in Italy. Um, these works incorporate actual quotes from various interviews of patient experiences, both good and bad, kind of summed up in short sentences for um, the viewers to reflect on. Uh, they offer insights into the personal healthcare journey and the feelings and stories that they felt needed to be told about their experiences. Uh, the quotes represent the real issues of health interactions and satisfaction or lack thereof and how that affected their health outcomes. So in bringing in these quotes, those um, who were interviewed felt their stories were being heard and it was bridging a gap of their specific areas of patient experiences and how they affected their health outcomes. Um, so that's just a little bit about my, my work and, um, I thank you very much for listening to my presentation. It's been a pleasure to hear the narratives and stories that we all carry on our journeys. And I welcome anyone who is interested in, uh, talking about these, uh, issues further. That would be great. Um, and I'm hoping to start my doctorate next year focused on furthering some of these ideas and looking at ways to help communication between patients and doctors and allowing our own narratives to become a part of kind of the complex life stories we all carry. So feel free to contact me if you'd like to carry on some more conversations about these things. Wonderful, thank you so much. Cool, thank you. Um, beautiful, thank you so much, Laurel. That was amazing. And, I, and I'm sure a lot of, um, I saw people writing some notes down. So hopefully we can get some good um, conversation at the end. Um, so Great. next up we have um, Liang Shui uh, with a paper titled, like I said before, Touching on the Unspeakable, Laura Marks Haptic Visuality and Trauma Related Art. So take it away, Liang, uh, and keep going. Okay, um, so I just wonder that if you can hear me properly. <laughs> um, we can hear you, Liang, all good. Okay, good. Share screen. Okay. I'm sorry, I think how to do this. Um, let me see. Let's struggle with that. Okay, here we are. Perfect. We've got it done. 
All right. Uh, seems like ah, this <laughs> screen is sheer. Sorry, just like this. It's a bit mess here. Um, we can see it, and yes. if you just um go to the bottom of your your PowerPoint and share it, so it takes up the whole screen. Um, you can go for it, but but we can see your screen perfectly. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Uh, so the paper I'm presenting today is touching on unspeakable Laura Max haptic visuality and trauma related art. Uh, as a unique form of memory, which is inaccessible to language, the elaboration of trauma through art requires an alternative approach to speak out on the unspeakable. Jill Banner terms such as uh, such art as trauma related art. Instead of directly referring to what happened as a testimony, this ad communicates sensation and effect with which to register something of the experience of traumatic memory. Then in touch sensuous theory and multi-sensory media, Laura Marx or prefers the theory of haptic visuality. Taking haptic sensation as its basic element, Marx defines it as an embodied and material visuality. The eyes in this visuality function like the organs of touch, and the viewers are drawn into a report with the other. Aligning with Jill's proposition of trauma-related art, this paper aims to illustrate the validity of a Marx theory as an art language in this art realm. Accordingly, an unfolding of trauma as an essential component here will initiate the discussion based on Simon Freud's trauma theory and Julia Christie, uh, Julia Christie's objection concept. Then the theory of haptic visuality will be elaborated along with concepts such as Maurice Meliaponti's body schema and, and, uh, and Erin Manning's insight into touching of its subverting power. Freud's understanding of trauma regards it as a result of an event the given stimulus of which happens in a very short space of time and is too enormous for the individual to process at the moment. Therefore, the trauma is left as a missed encounter that its assimilation, or rather its elaboration, can no longer be affected by normal means. The two phenomena in trauma, repression and repetition, have led to the theory of the unconscious in psychoanalysis. Freud explained that the essence of the process of repression, uh, repress, uh, repression lies in preventing it from becoming conscious. And the traumatic memory is pre uh, repressed into the unconscious mind. Oh, sorry, I just found, okay, probably just, yeah. Nevertheless, its aftermath can develop into symptoms including the repetition of compulsive activities, the purpose of which is to correct a painful past with, uh, which was not processed at the moment it occurred. Unconscious, therefore, refers to an, uh, any psychic process whose existence we are forced to assume on the evidence of its outward effects. Its relation with a language manifests in a process of content decision when approaching the repressed. The process may go so far that in a single word that the representation of a whole train of thought is taken over. In its process, the trauma is transformed into metaphorical language while the event itself is unrecognizable. Chris Davis' objection can be regarded as a philosophical development. Um, oh, sorry. I cannot. It's a bit. Yeah, uh, Christie's objection can be regarded as a philosophical development of trauma and the unconscious through a feminist perspective. It is closely associated with what she terms an initial loss, which refers to the infant's separation from the maternal body. The objection is that which replaced, which replaces what we have lost in the separation from the maternal body. The initial loss is usually an experience of sorrow, helplessness, and miserableness for the baby. 
Yet the separation plays a significant role in setting off the prerequisite for the emergence of the subject I and the deprivation creates a wanted object that is too opposed to the I. It is from the relationship between the two in this operation. Uh, in this opposition, any being, meaning, language, or desire is founded. Since the whole meaning system is based on the initial laws, the matter in the body and all that inhabit it, the caress, the breast, etc., are expelled from the system and are replaced by objection. To experience objection is to be faced with the truth that everything meaningful is based merely on inaugurous, inaugur inaugural laws. From Chris Devers' perspective, we are all haunted by the initial loss, which endures and structures the ensuing traumas with its pathogenic quality. Therefore, each ex experience of trauma is a reoccurrence of the initial loss. Hence, the encounter with the traumatic memory is to have the sense of being a subject threatened, and I is at the border of my condition as a living being. And the border is a frequently used phrase by Chris Deva. From my understanding, the border is formed synchronously, uh, synchronously with the initial loss. Its existence is the prerequisite of the, uh, the establishment of the subject to keep the I from the object. When being at the border, the boundary between I as the subject and the other as the object is disturbed and challenged. The significance of Chris Deva's objection lies in her feminist approach of trauma being inherently inaccessible to the linguistic system that the, that the experience itself points to what has been expelled in this initial separation from the maternal body. It echoes Lacan's reading of the principle of language as the law of the father to maintain the border. In this sense, Trauma owns immense power to be a violent, dark revolt of being that ejects the eye beyond the scope of the possible, the tolerable, the thinkable. Therefore, trauma becomes the void uh, of the experience. This may make trauma sound inevitable as a mere structural gap. However, to Griselda Pollock, trauma's after effects can be encountered in art and its traces may be processed authentically. Joe's articulation of trauma-related art believes it is realized from the contact between representation and effects. It means that this art evinces the memory by direct engagement and negotiation with the experienced sensations while requiring an intelligible discursive framework. By this means, the unspeakable may be uttered while at the same time, the encounter with the embodied sensations is not to be reduced to a purely emotional or sentimental reaction. The two aspects, representation and effects, render Jill's trauma-related art as a dual structure, while at the same time, the surface that the two aspects contact is not smooth and impervious, but textured and porous due to the constant tension between the memory being constitutively a conglom conglomeration of sensations and the demand to actualize it, that is, to, be, to have it represented. If we look back to Mark, uh, Mark's haptic visuality at this moment, we may find it echoes Joe's definition of trauma-related art in terms both of its structure and of the relationship between the two aspects. Based on understanding the act of gazing as visually touching the surface of an object or image, haptic visuality is viewed as an alternative model of saying to the mastering optical visuality that vision is more commonly understood to be. While seeing haptic uh, perception as the combination of tactile, uh, kinesthetic, and prior sorry, uh, like proprioceptive functions. Haptic visuality usually refers to a visual experience in which the viewer's bodies are deeply involved. The viewers contact the images in an intimate manner, as if not through the eyes alone, but along the skin. 
However, what needs to be remember to be remembered is uh, to be remembered is haptic visuality combines haptic perception with optical one. Touch and vision, according to the Lutz and Guattari, are not to be understood as a dichotomy to each other, but slide into one another. Accordingly, Marx depicts depicts the relationship between the two visuality, the haptic and the optical, as in a dialectic movement from solo optical to multi-sensory. My opinion is that this comment is also applicable to the understanding of the dynamic between the haptic perception and the optical one that coexist uh, co in haptic visuality. The major imagery examples of haptic visuality given by Marx in this book are from movies and video art. Some are taken from unfoxable, low-resolution cameras. Many are in close shots. By yielding the clarity of the image, it is to induce the viewers to visually touch each inch of the surface of the image and thoroughly absorb its material qualities, such as texture, luminosity, and tones. It is to indulge the audience in a flow of tactile impressions while the figure is still, to some extent, recognizable. From my art practice, this visuality can be obtained in other art forms as well, such as installation from orchestration of elements such as material reality, spatial arrangement, and visual mode, etc. The modulation of lighting and the employment of the tactile, te uh, tactile quality of diverse materials, for example, are some methods to, uh, to stylize the surface in the work. Therefore, it may evoke certain emo uh, sensations and emotions that our work aims to convey to its viewers in their visual touch on it. The optic aspect in this haptic, uh, optical aspect in this haptical, haptic visuality can be viewed as addressing the request of, in Jill's words, giving an intelligible discursive framework, while the haptic quality is to encourage a bodily relation between viewers and the viewed surface. And of course, the relationship between the two aspects is not to be understood as a dichotomy. The rest of uh, the rest of this paper will focus on the haptic aspect of this visuality, along with theories mainly from mainly Ponting and Manning, to discuss its capacity in art making to have the traumatic memory come into language. The core of Mili Ponti's uh, perception series emphasizes the role of bodily sensations and experience in our perception activity claiming it as the latent horizon of our experience. Melia Ponti's body schema defines the perceiving body as a united system. All the senses do not work as being simply, spatially juxtaposed, but integrate with each other. So it is not possible to fully divide them into separate sense experience. The body perceives each local stimulus as a whole. Therefore, Haptic sensations entangle with haptic sensations entangles with other senses, synesthetically operating along relation, uh, relational vectors, always in dialogue with other senses. Mili Ponte especially claims that the haptic sense closely associated associates with vision, that the translation between the givens uh, the given of touch into the language of vision and the assemblage of the two are completely once and for all. This echoes the Lutz and Guattari's understanding of the sliding relationship between haptic and optical sensations that flows into each other. The organ of haptic sensations is our skin, a network of nerve endings and receptors for the sense of touch. The hidden and infinite depths of skin is conceptualized by Mark C. Taylor, the organism as a whole is formed by a complex of demo layers. The body is, in fact, nothing but a, stri a strata of skin. In a sense, a touching skin is not only omnipresent, but also deep. At the same time, touch happens between two physical surfaces, 
a touching surface, which is usually the skin and the touched surface, either the skin of another body or an object. Ephraim Stroll describes a physical surface as the outer or upper aspect of physical entities, and depending on the nature of the object, the surface can be described can be described as rough, smooth, wet, dry, slippery, sticky, chipped, pitted, or damaged. I would like to emphasize the productivity of such a surface, since involved in an act of perception, it is effective in stimulating sensations. Therefore, we may be able to claim that when our skin is touching a surface, we are touched by the surface at the same time, a surface that maintains a sensory stimulus that is being effective and hence validates a mutual exchange. That's the loot says touching a surface as something leading to surface effect and defines the surface effects as incorporeal entities. They are not things or effects, but events, not, sub, uh, not substantives or adjectives, but, verb, but verbs. In politics of touch, sense, movement, sovereignty, Manning especially elaborates on touching as a power against the discursive dominance of our body. Relying on Meliopontis' insight that touch as a sense is omnipresent and the infinite depths of, us, of our skin as the organ of haptic sensation, touch for Manning is an act that saturates the whole body in evoked sensations. Meanwhile, being entangled with other senses, touch enables synchronization, which acknowledges the complex layering of the senses. The body that is touching, therefore, is a body that responds to various strata, strata and textures of articulation and gesture. This allows touching directly cast light, cast light on the presence of a body and enables unmediated access to evoked sensations. It therefore conjures up a sensing body that is able to transgress the previous boundaries set by the linguistic system. Language at this moment is rendered redundant. For Max haptic visuality, it turns viewers' eyes into an organ for haptic perception, and the viewers are pushed into contact with another surface. Like our skin, the network of nerve endings and receptors, we, therefore, bypass language and are open to being affected, while the optic aspect occasionally pulls us away from the surface. This puts us in an isolation between being a subject with a demarcating border and being in an intimate interaction with another surface, which dissolves the sense of boundary. From Christeva, experiencing trauma is to face the raw material of our existence, which belongs to what is encapsulated in the realm of the pre-linguistic at the moment of the initial loss. Therefore, trauma and its memory do not survive as a representation in the mode of objective consciousness, but as a manner of being. This manner of being can only be actualized in art as a twist of effects and thoughts. Max haptic visuality, according to her, is actually about evoking a robust flow between sensuous closeness, which is the relationship between mother and infant, between the initial separation and symbolic distance that is set up by the law of the father. In such an oscillation, the viewers may thereby touch on what once was unspeakable and that's to be touched. Thank you. Thank you so much, Liang. Another beautiful paper um, with a lot of great ideas and already a lot of uh, crossovers uh, to discuss. Um, so finally, our last uh, presenter, Lana Louisa Riles. Um, if you are ready, share your screen uh, and, and we can um, get into it. Okay. Can you hear me? We can hear you. All right. Um, da -da -da. Share screen, there we go. Oh, 
Um, oh, okay. Desktop one. Share. Perfect. And there we go. There. Is that looking good? It's looking good. Go for it. All righty. Okay. Hi everyone, my name's Lana. I'm a practicing artist in the field of painting. I'm interested in geometric abstraction and the intersections of art, magic and science. I previously attended the National Art School in Sydney and I'm now a PhD candidate at the University of Sydney. This image, Strange Skull, completed in 2005 is a series of five to 10 minute draw life drawings completed over a period of several months. They were then placed in a gridded sequ sequence that I then became, that then became one work, which has informed all other works since. Within this sequence, I attempted to dissolve the order, disorder, dualism to locate a self-ordering chaos. The title of the series, Strange Skull, is a metaphor taken from Kazimir Malevich's 1922 essay on non-objective art, in which he argues a similarity of purpose between spiritual and material interpretations of human beings and society. Malevich's vision of God is not a conventional conception of a religious deity, but God in the form of a super artist implying that man himself in endeavoring to take on the role of the artist can reach a divine perfection. He states, for this concept of God is an ultimate reality, intuitively revealing within oneself, consequently enabling man to act as God. Malevich reinforced the importance of artistic intuition by relating his ultimate reality with the human skull as he declared, is not the whole universe a strange skull in which meteors, suns, comets, and planets rush endlessly? The intersections of temporal lobe epilepsy, TLE, and its effects on visual art artists connects my project to the emergent interdisciplinary field of neuroaesthetics, which acknowledges the links between TLE and cre creativity. The term enchanted loom is a metaphor for the brain coined by pioneering Nobel Prize winning neuroscientist, Charles Sherrington. In his work, Man on His Nature, Sherrington introduced an original perspective to neurology that encompassed poetical and philosophical sensibilities, bringing together the connections between science and philosophical ideas on the mind and cognition. This included thoughts about the mind, human existence, and God in connection with natural theology. My research is an explanation of correspondences between my studio practice in painting and a neurological condition. While simultaneously exhilarating and devastating, my experience of TLE is a majest majestic transcendent experience that has forever changed my perception of existence. For much of my practice, I did not disclose or understand the origin or the motives of my paintings, viewing them with a detached curiosity. My works depicted influence of, influences of unusual phenomenological manifestations that were both perplexing and fascinating. After many years of research, I now understand the images were derived from intrinsic perceptions that science refers to as special sensory hallucinations or cognitive distortions sparked by epilepsy. Russian novelist Fyodor Dostoevsky suffered from TLE and referred to it as an indescribable something. Describing a seizure, he wrote, but it is an indescribable something which man in his mortal body can scarcely endure. He must either undergo a physical transformation or die. Known as one of the most famous epileptics in literary history, he made use of the disease by portraying characters within his novels who suffered epileptic seizures. My research asks, how do you describe a neurological disorder through painting? The experience I'm aiming to depict is an indescribable something. I'm wanting to maintain the connection with the indescribable something via my painting practice. Chasing the unknowable, 
and the undefinable is an enthrallment that has become the cornerstone of my theoretical and experimental doctoral research. My research grew out of interests I developed in cognitive science and its explanation for a spontaneous experience of altered consciousness. This then became the question of how the divide between humanist versus scientific interpretations of the experience could be reconciled within the painted image. My apprehension of a numinous-like aura coincides with the neuroscientific interpretation, which looks to the philosophical, forming the basis for my research. Current research into the neuroscience of hallucination links geometry and abstract art to biological geometric systems, which map in topic percepts. As a painter of geometric abstract forms, I'm interested in mapping the inner space of the numinous, which looks to the combinatorial logic of the mind and the brain. The seizures of Tealy are suggestive of metaphysical phenomena resulting in numinous like auras that include deja vu, jamais vu, dreaminess, feelings of detachment, autoscopy, derealization, time speed alterations and bodily distortions. How to define the experience of a neurological disorder through my painting practice and written research has proved to be a tangential question. My research is, for the most part, centred on the hypographic response, being the tendency to feel memories and emotions deeply and imbue those experiences with a religious and moral <coughs> significance and record them compulsively in drawing and writing. Also known as the poet's disease, Dostoevsky, Gershwin, Edgar Allan Poe, Joan of Arc, Vincent van Gogh and Oliver Sacks are all believed to have been sufferers. Neurologist Saver and Rabin originally coined the term numinous-like auras, believing it to be a valid construct to describe the trait of cosmic and non-traditional form of religiosity in TLE patients. Such phenomenological experiences may be comprised of the elements pertaining to mystical and supernatural experiences, and additionally, the metaphysical seizure experiences may inform belief systems. Numerous studies by neurologists have affirmed the notion of epileptic spirituality as being aligned to the concepts of the numinous, as it was defined to capture their supernatural qualities and also predicting that patients with higher frequencies of these auras would show higher non-conventional spirituality, but comparable to traditional religiosity. My experience of a numinous like aura is a deeply profound, ineffable experience that has raised numerous questions within my practice about the true nature and function of art within the human psyche. In seeking an aesthetic interpretation of a cosmic consciousness, my paintings utilize formalist diagra diagrammatic structures to explore metaphorically the anatomical circuitry and the various analogies that exist within the biological aesthetic functions of the brain and explores the significant status that geometry occupies in human consciousness. The theory of the numinous is explained in the tradition of the sublime as as an experience of God or ultimate reality. Mysterious, mysterium tremendum and the fascination of the love of God or ultimate reality. The numinous, according to Otto, can be understood as the experience of a mysterious terror and awe and majesty in the presence of what, of that which is entirely other and thus incapable of being expressed directly through human language and other media. In my research, I contend that my paintings are imaginary solutions for, for an experience of exceptional singularity being that of a numinous like aura. Otto likened this emotion to the uncanny, explaining that conceptually, mysterium denotes merely that is that which is hidden and esoteric that which is beyond conception and understanding, extraordinary and unfamiliar. According to Otto, the element of fascination carries with it the element of the awful and majesty, creating a strange harmony of contrasts. The tremendum aspect of the numinous is inferred in wrathful forms of divinity, correlated to experiences of curiosity and terror. 
when combined, the two qualities of being attractive and fascinating results in the diasonic, Dionysiac, sorry, element in the Newman, the demonic dread, the strange harmony of contrasts, or the element of fascination, according to Otto, may mean evil or imposing, potent and strange, queer and marvellous, horrifying and fascinating, divine and demonic, and a source of energy. An important aspect of my studio work is the element of the demonic divine. Otto points to the word uncanny and its fundamental meaning felt through consciousness as a fairly precise expression of the numinous. According to Anne Rabinovich, the sacred is that which breaks through the, the world of ordinary experience and therefore it, it must manifest itself infinitely to be known. Such manifestations can be found in surrealist art that has often been categorized as Gothic by the scholars. The Gothic, according to Otto, is the utmost representation of the numinous in all types of art due to the first place due the first place to its sublimi sublimity, but also drawing upon the lineage inherited from primitive magic. Otto points to the Cathedral of Ulm as being not magical, but numinous. However, he argues the word magic can be kept and used to describe artistic expressions of the numinous, should it come into being. According to anthropologist James Fraser, magic is the offspring of scientific or the theoretical activity in that it is an elusive science, a pseudoscience. Fraser further e explicates that the two forms of magic as being imit imitative magic and sympathetic magic. However, all magic is sympathetic in its or origin as there is a common bond that unites all things. The separation between oneself and nature and different kinds of objects is artificial. It is not real. Thus, sympathetic magic works on the speculation that things act on each other at a distance through a secret sympathy, the impulse being transmitted from one to another by an invisible power. The geometric symbols on the cave walls were said to be sympathetic magic, hunting <laughs> magic. The earliest expressions of human consciousness were expressed as images of abstract patterns on cave walls. Primitive cave paintings and rock markings of the Paleolithic period have been discovered in seemingly isolated and very, very varied locations around the world. The paintings and markings were thought to have been produced by shaman or clever men and rendered while in an altered state of consciousness. The images noted for their brightness, varied between abstract kaleidoscopic patterns, dots, grids, lozenges, networks, tessellations, and representational drawings of animals, humans, or hybrids of both. This was a significant discovery as it suggests that, that suggests the human trait of representing the world through imagery was initiated by this neuropsychological process. They were depicting what had come to them during their altered states of consciousness, drawing upon powerful visions and representing what they had seen in their hallucinations, even when they flashed by in a series of abstract patterns. They were transferring onto cave walls images that were in topic, not from direct observations around them. They were transferring on, onto cave walls Sorry, they were transferring on cave walls images they already had behind their eyes. British academic Nigel Spivy states that the rock surfaces became interfaces between reality and the spirit world on which the imagery of the trance was recorded and displayed. As mentioned earlier, seizures originating from the temporal lobe can result in visual and auditory illusions, hallucinations, alterations of consciousness, such as trances, dreamy states, flashbacks, deja and jamais vu, time distortions and the illusions, illusion of a presence. According to Saver and Rabin, religious experience is brain-based and the clues to the neural substrate of numinous religious experience may be comprehended from TLE, near-death experiences and hallucinogen ingestion. Neurologist MacDonald Critchley points out that it can be difficult to, to distinguish between TLE seizures and common religious and mystical states, 
which commonly include incorporeal voices, flashes of light and visions. Similarly, neurologist Paul Spears surmises that the widespread interest in reincarnation mysticism, out-of-body experience, experiences UFOs and aliens is the result of mild undiagnosed TLE in the general population. Canadian neurologist Michael Persinger goes one step further asserting that all spiritual experience derives from an altered tem temporal lobe limbic electoral activity. American philosopher and psychologist William James expressed an aversion to, a to attempts to absorb religious experience into what he called medical materialism stating quite illogical to plead the organic causation of a religious state of mind. Paraphysics is a branch of theoretical physics studied by theoretical and experimental physicists exploring subjects that go beyond naturally occurring phenomena of the five senses, including the reality of any dimension of space or time beyond the normally sensed four dimensional space time continuum of our common experience. First acknowledged as a new branch of science in the mid 1970s with the publication of the Journal <coughs> of Paraphysics, Paraphysics, the physics of, par of the paranormal has resulted in new areas of research, including government research from the Monroe Institute being the gateway experience for the application of the study of paranormal abilities. Often denounced as a pseudoscience, the origins of pa paraphysics can be found in the 1800s, then known as parapsychology. The Society for Psychical Research, SPR, included early proponents of parapsychology, being the psychologist William James and philosopher Henry Bergson. Areas of research included hypnotism, hypnotism apparitions, telepathy, rainbacks phenomena being odic force, hauntings and the physical aspects of spiritualism such as table tilting, apitation and materialization. The SPR also investigated apparitional experiences such as hallucinations resulting in the publication of the census of hallucinations in 1890. Current theories in paraphysics today involve psi theory which claims that there is some form of interaction between the individual and the environment. Current psi theories purport that anomalous phenomena such as extrasensory or paranormal phenomena are the result of an entirely normal cognition. In contemporary visual arts, the term teleplasty has been used to combine par paraphysics with current theories in neuroaesthetics. Derived from electrical science and the psychic arts, teleplasty is a term for the material representation of things that are coded, imagined, or imagined at a distance. Plasticity is also intended to reference the cognitive brain science and fine art by the use of the word, which references neuroplasticity and the plastic arts. Neuroscientist Charles, S. Charles Sherrington's weaving metaphor, the enchanted loom speaks to the notion of one of Rudolf Otto's favorite metaphors in which he relates the non-rational numinous experience as the wolf and the ethical and the rational as the warp. Therefore, the warp is the feeling of awe that is consistent to the specific nature of the holy in all religions, while the object of awe forms the weft. Weaving has been used metaphorically to discuss cosmological constructs throughout history, engaging with themes relating to the dualistic nature of the weaving processes that it is concurrent while being concurrently holistic. A numinous-like aura represents an incandescent juncture, a sudden yet disturbing alliance of magic and the demonic divine incited by chance. The moment of insight intensifies and the dimensions of time and space are altered. Like a secret opening in the fabric of ordinary ex experience, these moments are, uh, these moments as the only true reality as expressive of both the randomness and hidden order that surrounds us. That was a quote by Roger Shuttick. And that's it. Thank you. Okay. How do I stop sharing my screen? Oh, escape. If you just. 
Oh, stop share at the top. Yeah. Got it. You got it. Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful um, presentation, Lana. Thank you all so much for sharing your, your beautiful art practices with us. Um, there are so many kind of intersecting philosophical inquiries that that underline them all. Um, and I think uh, uh, that should make for some lovely conversation, um, even between uh, the three of you as an introduction. Um, so I might try and just pin you all so that you can um, kind of act as the panel on the screen. Where are we? Can we do, oh yes, it's working. Okay, lovely. Um, and maybe I'll, can I pin myself as well? I think so. Just so that you. Wonderful. And I might turn you around so that you can see all the lovely faces in the room um, in, in person with us. But thank you, everybody, for um, zooming in. I'll just turn it around slowly. Um, there we go. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> so these are all the people who were listening in. Um, would anybody like to start off the, the discussion with any questions, comments? You're more than welcome to use the chat function as well if you, you don't feel comfortable using your mic. Um, but yes. And also, if you if you do have a question and you're in the Zoom room, maybe put up your hand um, using the, the function just so that I, I, I can um, uh, kind of give you the floor. Yes. So any questions, comments? Great. Um, that's fascinating. Like, um, I, I'm not even sure about the question. It's kind of more of a uh, getting your thoughts on on why you've chosen some of the, the the imagery you've chosen. Because when I was thinking about your the ideas of the of, of magic and and the experiences of, of um, sort of neurological disorders, etc they seem to have a certain amount of um, random and erraticness to them. There's, there's, a, there's a, a sort of um, ambivalence around them. Yeah. So have you chosen geomet why geometric shapes? Is it, is, it a, is it an attempt to organize that or? Yes. I'm not quite, yeah. Yeah, yeah so, absolutely. So it's a way to make sense of it um, geometrically, like to, to, to con constrain it or control it or. Yeah, that's, it, that's precisely it. But it was something I just started off doing intuitively. And then I looked at um, Cluverian forms, um, which were also geometric patterning shapes that we have in our brain that, that we um, all universally have. So I started to notice there were similarities with the images I, I produced um, and with Cluverian forms. So I, I just sort of, I think it's probably, you know, it's something that's intrinsic within all of us is the geometric patterning, which, you know, they, they, that um, they were doing in the cave paintings while they were hallucinating in trances. So um, I don't know. I think, I think the reason for asking is that just to get more sort of explanation here is partly because of what I was, would have been expecting. Like if it was just without seeing any visual art and just discussing the topic, Geometry might not have been what I was expecting to see produced from that, mm -hmm. and yet that's what you chose. And it was just a little bit more of an explanation around that because it kind of, in one way it's contradictory, but in another way it's a really interesting way to reinterpret. And uh, yeah, I was just wondering where you were going. I, I, I guess the artists I look at um, in my thesis, and I probably I tossed up whether I should have included them, but it probably would have offered probably more of an answer to your question. I, I've looked at artists. Um, particularly from the early, um, from like 19, early 1900s, um, they were using geometry. And that's why I, I referenced Malevich and I use Hilma F. Clint and, and people like Paul Lafferley, and I'm not sure if people are familiar with them, but they use geometry. Um, and I guess it references sacred geometry, you know, right back to the days of, you know, Plato as being perfect forms. Um, yeah. So I, 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 you know, there's, I probably should have included that, but the geometry is, um, yeah, very specific. And, and 
Would that be right? This is, you were saying instinctive for you. Yes, it's it. Yes, it's in absolutely, and and um, you know, they've been using. I mean, sacred geometry has just been with us through the beginning of time. So I kind of, you know, I, I liken it to that as well. You know, to me, it's my personal sacred geometry. Thank you. And Nick also has a comment just to kind of um, support, I guess, that discussion too in the chat. Um, I have visual aura with migraine to the point that I have been tested for TLE. I can see how much experiences could be interpreted as otherworldly. Many of my aura perceptions are geometric in nature. I describe it as being akin to polar coordinate of four, well, of fours rather than a Cartesian. Um, Forms. Forms, yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I have migraine, visual migraines too. So th there's probably that as well. And I, I also suffered from hip hypnagogic, well, hypnagogic visions when I was younger. So, and they were all shapes as well. They were geometric shapes. So I guess it is, yeah, it, it definitely relates to that. Really fascinating. Um, I have a question, uh, Lauren and Lynn, and although Laura, I have to apologize because I came late to your presentation, but I grabbed some things at the end. So uh, for both of you, uh, so is there a limit, I guess, there's a realm of what cannot be said, what cannot be expressed in terms of loss and pain, and either obviously touching or seeing uh, to our uh, what it gives, would you say it's enhancing some empathy in, in the person that had that experience and um, will enhance, um, you know, just way of no verbal communication with others? Because, oh, oh there's definitely a way that we can open a new way of verbally say what is happening or what we have experienced or even if we're not, let's say, the direct victim of, of a traumatic episode by just seeing the art uh, or touching it, we can relate like, okay, yes, this actually reminds me or is a like of something that I have lived or someone close to me have lived. So with the question then would be, uh, there's always a limit with the words to express that, or we can actually through this, Ex uh, um, experiences get more language to point out what is happening to the viewer. Um, so that's a question for me. I just want to, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh. <laughs> for both. I mean, oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think I think when I read uh, Laura Mack's uh, haptic visuality, I, I think that what she want to say was not that we have to, uh, you know, own uh, the artist's experience as our own. It's more like to gain a sort of, I would not say understanding, but I want to say it's, um, this provide a sort of a channel or a meaning that we can touch on this kind of experience in some way through that kind of, you know, exchange of these kind of emotions or sensations that we get from visually touch on the surface of the image or whatever. So I, I'm not, I don't think it's like, for example, after we, we take a look of a certain artist's uh, work about trauma, where we totally again, that traumatic memory as our own experience, but it's more like that we would sort of gain um, a, like a mutual understanding or that to, you know, some of our emotions or memories would be evoked in certain way and like more like through sensations or emotions. So I think it's quite like what she mentioned about its alternative mode of saying, alternative mode of saying an artwork about this kind of traumatic uh, experience or sometimes even not uh, traumatic, but I think this kind of mode of saying, or oh, this kind of art language can also apply to other art forms. 
Um, yeah, I think, yeah, I, I, I would not take it as totally, you know, you just like read a story of something that after that you gain a, a, a very clear idea about who's the, you know, who's the main character in this and what the main character experienced. But it's between, I think it's between, it's like that kind of tension between effects and thoughts. Yeah, it, it's like you, you try to link, uh, it's like it, it brings you to the border between these two and you sort of gain some experience after that. But this experience not necessarily point to exactly to what the artist depict as his or her or their experience, but they might echo some of your experience or your emotions or these, uh, sensations you have had in the past. Yeah. Thank you. And for Laurel, um, because my mom is a doctor and she has got many years to, you know, new doctors. And one of the things she, she always tells me it's how hard for her is to, that they understand that beyond the practice, the beyond, you know, you just going to be a doctor, get the title. There's a person there. There's a humanity. There's a world there that they need to really take into account. This is not just here's the diagnosis. She really worked hard to, and, and, and it's been years and, 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 and I experiment and I don't know if everyone else here, but sometimes like how impersonal it is to go to the doctor. And that's why sometimes we don't want to, mm -hmm. you know, so, but I, I see to add that how amazing it's just to expand with even their imaginations just to see that to art to in a maybe in an abstract way what the patient can be feeling or what the patient can I don't know so it is was kind of aiming with the with the art that you are developing for the doctors or for the students yeah the um I'm currently working on a, a series that uses um myself as a, a conduit uh, for conversations uh, with with my own doctors mm -hmm. um, and I'm hoping to start my PhD in the new year um, and look at um, because it becomes a little bit tricky doctors get very hung up on ethics um, mm -hmm. of using mm -hmm. patients and those sorts of things so I've had to transform it into a a dialogue between myself and my doctors and I'm already um, producing some work in the series um, and it involves um, me using my self and my communication with my doctors and their participation but more often um, the goal is for me to take the lead in the conversation uh, rather than the doctor because normally when you go to the doctor you have they hold the power the knowledge the um, yeah. presence um, and um, oftentimes I think they forget that you know we as human beings are the most knowledgeable person about ourselves is ourselves um, and that's an equally important part um, so I'm working on a, a, a series at the moment where um, I take leadership over the experience with my doctors and I get, I'm, I'm teaching them something. So one, one of the pieces is um, I'm, I'm working on um, is molding the hands of my doctor and it revolves taking a, a casting mold of my doctor's hands but it, it's me most people haven't done that before so therefore i'm the holder of the knowledge i'm the holder of the instructional content um mm -hmm. in that case um and i have a surgery coming up in january and i'm working with the surgeon to um they uh, you know the uh, as they put me off to the plan anyway is as they put me off to sleep um, for the surgery that the um, entire theater um, of doctors and nurses sing the New Zealand national anthem, um, commenting, oh, wow. on, <laughs> wow. um, commenting on, you know, socialized healthcare here versus, or I'm currently in America right now, but um, mm -hmm. the, the 
the socialized health care that happens in New Zealand. And I, I've had many, many surgeries on the New Zealand dollar um, and how I, I would never be able to have that achieved in America right now. So mm -hmm. I, it, it involves me taking the leadership and instructing the, the theater nurses and, and anesthetists and and that sort of thing to, to kind of reverse the role of, of empowerment in those sorts of situations. So working on a bunch of different things and I hope to explore them further in my PhD um, this coming year. Mm, thank you. Uh, yes, we have a, uh, another question. Yeah, so um, I've actually got a question for each person that given time I'll just ask one and see if other people have something. But um, this is for uh, you. Uh, Liang, um, you, you linked haptic perception to optical perception. What happens if the person is blind? Do other sorts of perception then come into play? Um, sorry, uh, I, I didn't really hear your question very clearly. So you mean like I brought up like haptical perception and optical perception and... Uh, and blind and blindness. What if a person is blind? How does the haptic then work? Yeah, that's a good question. That's a good question. I think that's like a blind spot for maybe this paper. I probably <laughs> need to point it out at, at the beginning. It's like, you know, um, but I think for blind people, maybe, yeah, because I, I'm, I've never been in that position. Uh, no, it's not really. I think I once I once was in a very dark room, but I think it was like a performance art mm. artwork. And the, uh, in that room, there's like people lying on the floor or, you know, they just uh, stood in the darkness somewhere. And I totally just used my body to touch. That was like a experience for me, you know, sort of similar to blind, blind. So I think at that time, I totally just need to rely on my body and on my skin, you know, as a surface and a touch. And whenever I, I, I felt like I touched it on another person's body, I sort of felt like a little bit timid, but also that kind of sense was sort of, I think it was quite magic experience because you also feel, because that was a performance art. So the first thing was that I, I knew I was safe. And I feel like when I touched on, you know, by accident, by accident, touching on another, another people, another person's body, I thought of had that kind of uh, feeling that it, it was quite intimate because you didn't really know them. But in this darkness, I felt like my body sort of, you know, feel quite good, that kind of feeling. you just uh, touching on another surface of another person's body. Um, I don't think this really answers your question, but it's just like, you know, it brought to me this memory before. Yeah, but thank you. That I think that's like a blank spot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, Malcolm, do you have a yes, follow-up to I, that? I do, actually. Yeah. yeah. Kia ora, Kia ora Yang, Yang and uh, Lana. Um, I'm, yeah. <laughs> uh, just, just listening to, to your response to that question, um, it sort of ties together a couple of questions that that relate to, to what Lana was speaking to and perhaps your response just to uh, Stephen's question. And, and I was thinking, um, if, for example, with a blind person, um, there's, if the person has been blind for a long time, there's a certain pathology, if you like, that comes about in terms of haptic response that's a deficit in terms of uh, a visual response. So that um, as a way of adaptation, people might have when they're blind, enhanced sensation or or their neurological pathways decide you know learn how to respond to the world through you know touch and atmosphere temperature and a, a range of different things um, but the thought that i had in relation to what line was also talking about in terms of um, her experience of creativity which is informed by um, the condition tle as i think it is in terms of a neurological condition, is that there's a sort of theme here with um, pathologizing creativity. And, and is it necessary to go down that route in terms of how, say, for example, in Lana's context, you know, you seem to be suggesting that, um, you know, the true nature and the function of art, the essence of art, 
resides in, in, in this um, phenomenon or phenomenology that we have in relation to our, ourselves and our, our mental and physical makeup. And um, I'm just wondering how far down that route do you really need to go given that you know, these conditions exist? Do, do you need to externalize it and um, perhaps have a framework, I mean, a epistemological framework for it that may be not necessary, given that, you know, like, for example, in art, there's been such a long history of creative practitioners involved in spiritualism, theosophy, you know, Bergson and Holism, and also indigenous cultures also have holistic um, frameworks that don't really need to be explained in terms of Western epistemologies. That's a very long question. <laughs> <laughs> how, how, how long is the piece of string this one? Yeah, <laughs> look, um, you know, firstly, I'm discussing it because I'm writing a PhD about it. So, I mean, that 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 answers that basically short, in a short um, sentence. But um, secondly, there is no, for me, uh, there is no answer on, on both sides of it. We don't know. There's the ineffable, ineffable, ineffable and we, we don't know. We can make assumptions in science and we can make um, conclusions. Um, but what it is, we don't know. Um, and I, I have looked at Indigenous art when I did my master's. I was fascinated with the dream time. And I actually started my paper with the quote from Emily Kinware. Um, you know, I paint the whole lot. That's what I paint the whole lot. So that mm -hmm. sums it up for me. And when I talk about Otto and ultimate reality and the neuroscientists are talking about ultimate reality, um, a oneness, you know, Malevich is talking about ultimate reality. Uh, I guess that's my lineage. I'm just looking at, at you know, people that discuss the spiritual and, and um, yeah. And I, I, to me, there's similarities with the dream time, the Indigenous dream time, but I'm not going to speak to that because I don't, you know, I don't have experience, I don't have enough knowledge and that's not my field. So I guess I can do question is how necessary is it to make a bridge between the two that gets to an essential statement about you know this connection yeah look you know it definitely the question informs my work so my art practice is fueled by by both sides of the debate i'm interested in the mind body conundrum and i've met with neuro a neuroscientist from sydney uni he's you know he specializes in synesthesia and we have fascinating discussions about metaphysics. And, you know, he he's definitely motivated by metaphysical concerns. And, you know, for him as a scientist, he's, you know, the big conundrum is the Cartesian duality. I, fi I find it fascinating. You know, how does the mind connect with the body and, you know, thoughts, sensations and creativity, the whole conundrum. And I, and that, <laughs> <laughs> For me, like, just reacting to this, sort of part of the question why I asked the question I asked was, in some respects, I think that's how it's on. I know you're doing a PhD for this and fantastic, but in some ways, the explanation is not necessarily the artworks enough. Um, I would have been fascinated by the titles of the geometric works alone and the representation they were. Uh, as well, uh, I think the explanations and the, the, the research has gone into all of them, frankly, um, not just you, Lone, is, is wonderful and fascinating. Mm -hmm. But um, and I've learned a lot from mm -hmm. that. But then the artist in me, who's probably more commercial than um, fine arts based, but the artist in me goes sometimes, you know, I think reassuringly, I think the art is enough at times as well. And then, mm -hmm. yeah, don't be afraid of just putting the art in the itself. Mm. Not let others figure it out, and don't need to explain themselves. Oh, yeah. I, yeah, no, I agree with that totally. And you know, there there were time constraints, so in twenty minutes, I had to make a decision. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. That's awful. <laughs> yeah, I had to make a decision. And when I when I break my when I write about my art, it does make more sense. And I perhaps in future, I would probably lean towards speaking specifically and breaking down the materials I use, why I use them. And, and you know, I've actually learned from this presentation the, the gaps of, mm. you know, uh, the explanation. So, yeah. 
Yeah, I didn't see. It. Sorry, for me, it wasn't there weren't any gaps. Just to reassure you all there, it wasn't so much that I found a hole. It was just I found my expectations weren't. Uh, you didn't deliver what I was expecting because of my own sort of bias or personal perception of what it should have been. Versus yeah. what you interpreted, and that was where my question was: is just sort of some information as to and yours was it's distinctive partially yeah. um sending me to commentary so yeah no i i i really enjoy all of it um, mm. from all of you for those reasons just as an artist and i sometimes i think the explanations are angry in a way but they didn't keep and they were very very sound and very solid very deep so thank you thanks thanks for the questions by the way they're good they've been helpful yeah um, Stephen, did you have follow-up questions? I, I realize we jumped. I just, I mean, yes, that's fine because that was, that was fine. Um, this is a question for Laurel. Um, so what do you think the relationship, is there a relationship between your work and the work that's going on in the graphic medicine community where they're using comics and graphic novels to, in that sort of healthcare environment? Yeah. Um... I, in terms of my goals um, in, in a longer term scheme of things, I, I would love for my art to help translate some of um, the, those kind of communication issues. Um, and, you know, I, 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 as I, I mentioned, I, I am from a painting background um, and uh, il illustrating backgrounds, but I, for the last I got very bored of doing illustrations, to be honest, and and I started looking at more uh, different ways that I could communicate and and um, the materiality of things and you know what something can mean um, you know and, and now now I'm doing performance based uh, communications and and I think that you know that there's a, a lot of really good work out there that helps to communicate both for the patient and for the doctor. And there's a lot of um, current work uh, with doctors going in and using illustrations to help and uh, translate, you know, like infections or, you know, things like that, you know, like how do you visually depict um a, a, an infection so that you know exactly what kind of thing to treat um it with um but yeah i think there's a there's a crossover there and um i you know while i my my current work is is very linked to me personally um i it's not because i i i, I feel that it's my own story that needs to be told it's that I've run into some constraints with ethical concerns between doctors and patients, and and so I've had to navigate around that by um, using my own experiences and my own body um, to translate things. Um, and so um, the PhD will probably be more focused on my own work with doctors um, that I, I have a lot of medical um, a lot of medical issues and, and things so I, I i've got a genetic condition and a whole bunch of other stuff and so um i do have a lot of fodder for <laughs> for mm -hmm. extending um those kind of conversations and it's uh, initially doctors are a little bit reserved to to um participate but like once you kind of win them over a bit they they have been willing um, in the efforts to communicate more um, and whether that's graphic um, information um, in the end result, who knows. Um, I, I personally would like to see some changes to the medical education community um, and how uh, doctors are trained to listen to patients um, autonomy and things like that so if there's a lot of crossovers with a lot of those sorts of things um but i do love a good uh illustration of a of, of a muscle or a, a bone so uh, can, I, can i wait on that a little bit Laurel, for you i think um as a commercial artist and you know in that sort of field i think that way of communicating probably has a sort of sterilization to the conversation anyway I think what you're doing 
from a the perspective of a medical student or a doctor or a practitioner understanding the patient condition. I think more there's probably a little bit more power in what the way you're saying the same thing is that an illustration that describes a medical event or a comic or a commercial or whatever piece of media. Well, as, as I said, I got the between describing it and emotionally connected with it. I think we got something there that is a good learning tool for those that medical side of the spectrum. I think it's it got more I feel a lot more value for them to understand the other part of the equation they're in versus um sort of my personal experience with doctors from the other side. But so I think it's got I think it's quite a bit of power in the way you're saying it's thank you. Yeah, the um, it was very interesting because my uh, my gallery show <laughs> was seen by um, a few doctors um, who approached the dean of the Wellington University of Otago Wellington um, Med School and said, "There's really important things going on in in Laurel's work, and we would love to have her come exhibit at the um, at." the medical school, which I did do. And I also got the opportunity to do a, a grand round um, presentation with, um, which if, if you're not familiar with the medical community, it's basically um, sessions that are, are talking about current um, medical advances, those sorts of things where all the professors and the doctors come along to hear um, those sorts of things. And I gave, I, I felt very awkward as an artist coming into that forum, but, um, you know, that there are uh, lots of great conversations that are happening. And, and I've had doctors say that, you know, by experiencing my work that they've changed their philosophy on how to, um, deal with patient concerns and things, which is, you know, it feels very empowering to me. And, um, uh, to be able to to do something that that can transform things for people. Yeah, I think you're all doing that. Yeah. Uh, I think, you know, and just to reiterate that, I think it's because it's um, disruptive in its delivery. It's different from the expectation of how that information would normally be delivered in, in all cases. And 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 with yeah. the mm -hmm. um, I think you're achieving what art is intended to do. It's challenging to me. I, I look at it and go, what's my perception of what art or communication should be? But that's the power of it because it's an unexpected way of presenting information or ideas or experiences. So, yeah, I think it's all one of the words. I, I'd just like to add to that, Laurel, um, in particular, your use of found objects and your <laughs> translation of those objects in your practices is particularly strong. Um, I really respond to that. Uh, you know, the use of the um, plastic anatomy foot, uh, all those elements that you've brought in as you know from from those places, from those contexts. I think that works really well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I have a fondness for materiality and the actually the weirdly the aesthetics of certain medical equipment and things like that. You know, I I appreciate them for their visual impact as as much as function in a lot of ways. Um, well, you mentioned and, the uncanny too, in terms of weirdness. I think that's the it's a, quite an important context there. Yeah, well, the I mean, my art is not for everyone, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> people, um, you know, it take it sometimes takes people a, a, a wee while to kind of absorb it. Um, and in fact, at the medical school, um, we had uh, I had an issue with the piece of my son's placenta. Um, that the local Maori uh, Komatoa um, felt very uncomfortable having that in that space, even mm -hmm. though the medical school library was literally right next door to my exhibit and you could look up placentas and, and see very graphic images. Um, but for some reason, the, the confrontation with the Maori content, um, there was a, a little bit of a back and forth with that sort of thing. But um, you know, like I, I, I like the materiality to kind of communicate uh, with my artwork, and I'm, I appreciate both Lana and Liang, your your um, 
your messages is, is are are great and wonderful, but the aesthetics of your works are are also really powerful. And um, yes. I enjoyed seeing um, the visual representation of, of what we're all talking about here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you all so much. And um, we should probably wrap it up there. We've gone a little bit over, but I think that's just testament to the um the the, the beautiful practices that I think are all quite deeply personal in some ways and have a lot of um, really similar kind of research as practice philosophies threading through them. So um, I just want to say thank you, Liang, Laurel and Lana, the three L's, it's, yeah. they sound beautiful together as well. Um, so we'll give you another round of applause. <laughs>